Welcome to Philosophy and Faith, where our goal is to help you navigate your intellectual and spiritual journey, especially in regards to topics like God, faith and doubt, meaning and purpose, and more. I'm Nathan Beeson. And I'm Daniel Jepson. And together we discuss the big questions that humans have wrestled with for thousands of years. We're glad you can join us. We're going to have an overview of the four great worldviews. Yep, that's what we're going to do. So so uh, we were just talking a second ago about the classification of these. Obviously, there are a lot of worldviews, but you're you're kind of wanting to categorize them into four. Can you talk about that? How are we doing this? Right. So obviously, there are a lot of viewpoints and philosophies and worldviews. But as I've kind of thought through them, I think that there are primarily four that you can subsume the others under. And one way to think about it is is an analogy with biological classifications. Okay. So our species is Homo sapiens, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but our genus, which is above that, is that we are primates, a genus that also includes, for example, chimpanzees and, and orangutans. And then above that, you have the family, which would be all mammals. Okay. So we are of the species, Homo sapiens, or the genus primates, but we're of the family of mammals. And in that family, we find a lot of different company. You have dolphins, you have foxes, you have horses, but they all share some things in common. Yeah. So what I try to get across is that to me, there are four families of philosophies or worldviews. That doesn't mean there are only four philosophies or worldviews. It means in the broader picture, there are four families. Each one has its genus underneath that. Yeah, yeah. And then species below that. So they branch out. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. So we are classifying these as theism, atheism, pantheism, and polytheism. And throughout this podcast series, we're going to look at the different questions of philosophy that we went over last time yeah, and how each of these four great worldviews would interact with the questions of how we know what we know or what is real or what is valuable or ethics question or these kinds of questions. So today we're going to talk about metaphysics. Right. Or the question of what is. Metaphysics really big technical word that seems uh, a little intimidating. All it means is basically the things that we believe about what we can't immediately see or the things beyond the physical realm or the physical universe. Gotcha. So questions of transcendence, questions of whether or not there's a God who exists. Yeah, that's the big one. Oh, got it. God's existence is the big one. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's kind of the categories of Theism, atheism, pantheism, and polytheism. They, those all kind of share a few different letters. Sure. Well, obviously, theos is a Greek word for God. Okay. Theism is the belief that there's one God who created the universe. And then underneath that, you'd have three, say, genus of primarily Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, okay. the Jewish faith. And then atheism would be the negation of that, the belief that there is no God, that there is nothing outside the universe. And there are a lot of different variations of that, but all of them would believe that the physical cosmos is all that there is and all that there ever was. Nothing transcends it. Okay. You could call it by different names. You could call it naturalism in the sense of you're believing that only natural as opposed to supernatural things are real. Or you could call it materialism. There's different ways to use that word. Sometimes we may think we're talking about people who like to shop too much. <laughs> but here it just means that they believe that only matter material exists. It exists in different forms, including energy, but there's nothing beyond matter. Okay. Or you can call it physicalism, the idea that only physical things exist. And those aren't quite necessarily synonymous, but they're all kind of within this broad grouping where the physical reality, the physical universe, is the whole shebang. That's neat. So I, it's so it's not monolithic. You could have people who are atheists that have varying views on metaphysics. Well, varying views on 
maybe not on metaphysics on the existence of God, but on uh, how that plays out. Day -day. Yeah, there are slight variations in terms of what they would think about the status of things that you cannot see. Okay. For example, they may have different opinions on whether there's such a thing as a soul. Okay. Or if that soul could be different than just a, a phenomenon or an epiphenomenon of the body uh, and the mind, or the brain rather. So there's going to be a little bit of variation on questions like that, but there's not any variation on the question that there is no God. There's nothing outside the physical universe. Everything is explainable by the physical universe and cause and effects within this closed system. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that's theism and atheism. Right. How about pantheism? Sure. So pantheism, Greek word for God, theos, Greek word for all or every, pan. Pantheism is the belief that in some way, all things are God and God is all things. The main idea is that to say something is God and say something is nature or the natural world are two ways of describing the same thing. Hmm. There's not a distinction between God and and the, the universe. Interesting. One very common viewpoint is that the idea of duality, so duality meaning there are two things, God and the universe, is itself a very fundamental mistake, hmm. that there's only oneness. And all other things that we may think are divided are simply an illusion or even a trick that our mind plays on us. That's interesting. So that, that would be the family of pantheism. What would be some of the species or? Well, the big one here is Hinduism. Okay. It's the, got the most ancient pedigree. It's most consistent, at least in the way it's taught. That's the big one. And then Buddhism is kind of an offshoot of Hinduism. And then you have various different Eastern thought. Most of the philosophies and religions that arise out of the Indian subcontinent or China or Japan are going to be classified under this broad family. Okay. Okay. So what about polytheism then? Sure. Poly is Greek word for many or multi. And it's the belief that there are a whole lot of different gods with, within the universe. So polytheism usually takes the form in history of paganism. Again, paganism technically is not a very precise word. It originally just meant people who lived in rural areas. So something like Hicks, we might Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but it got association with those who believed in the old religions, which were polytheistic. That's good to know, because I, 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 could, I could call some people I know pagans, you know. Sure. Uh, as, as it technically means. That, that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> yes. Well, you, you could do that. I'm sure they would appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sure they would. So, uh, yeah. So the technical term is not paganism, but polytheism, the belief in that there are a multitude of gods usually representing different forces of nature or human experience. And they're going to take different forms. So Greece has their gods, starting with Zeus and working all the way down. And Rome will have their gods, who are very similar, of course, to the Greek gods. But then Egypt will have their gods. Babylonia will have their gods. The Norse religion will have their gods. It's very widespread. It's going to be the most common form of belief in antiquity, at least. Gotcha. So we've heard a little bit of an overview about each of the four great worldviews. Let's talk about this idea of God and God's relation to the world, how each of these worldviews would recognize God's relationship to the world or lack thereof. So maybe starting again with theism, how would, how would the theistic family understand God's relationship to the world? Right. That's, that's good. And the reason we start here is because this question about the relationship between God, if there is one in the world, is going to be the most fundamental question in the history of human thought. That's a bold statement. It is. It is. But I, I think we can back it up. Yeah. So what determines each of these belief systems is that question. What's the relationship between God, if there is one and the, and the world. For the Christian, Judaic, and Islamic perspectives, so monotheism, belief in one God who created the world, they believe 
that ultimate reality is not physical, but personal, because there is a person who created the rest of what we see. And that's not true, at least not in the same way with the other worldviews. For example, with atheism or materialism, the ultimate reality is physical. That's a very fundamental difference that a lot of people don't really appreciate, I think. So, in the Christian understanding, you can even go beyond that. You can say that not only is the ultimate reality personal, but you can also say that there is one activity or one value that is ultimate because it exists before the creation of the world, and that is love. So the Christian worldview teaches that before the universe began, not that you could technically use before as a time word, but as a logical word, that before the universe began, God existed. He is more fundamental than the universe itself, and that he existed in the form of three equal persons dwelling together in a realm that we can't yet understand. But one thing we know is that it's a realm of love. And this is the teaching of the New Testament. Uh, John 17 talks about this. Ephesians 1 talks about this. And out of that desire of the Trinity to express that love more fully came the decision and the will to create the physical universe. So the universe is real. It's not an illusion like uh, some Eastern thinkers would, would state. It's real, but it's not ultimate. And it's here because it's, it's created by the will of a person or persons who have certain values that predate the physical world itself. So that's very fundamental. And it's very different than, say, atheism, right? Yeah. So with atheism, what's ultimate is matter. So we have in mechanism, the Big Bang and, and the expansion of the universe for how that matter formed into the present universe that we see and can experience. But we don't have any answer for why that matter is there. Heidegger called this the fundamental question of philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing? And atheism cannot give an answer for that because there's no way to give an answer. You can't give a scientific answer. You can't give a historical answer. You can't really think of a way that you could answer that question apart from the idea that it was brought into being for a purpose. So in atheism, what is fundamental is not personal, but impersonal. It's not rational, but irrational. Matter by itself, just bare matter, doesn't have thought or purpose. What do you mean irrational? Irrational doesn't mean crazy. It just means it's not something that is rationally and purposefully structured. How do you say this? Rational here simply means that it abides by the by our understanding of reasoning, logic, and purpose. So it's so an atheistic worldview doesn't need rationality unless it served some sort of competitive advantage in natural selection? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, that's, no, that's not exactly what I'm saying. Obviously, atheists are rational. Right. Okay. That, yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand. It's Sure. So we're not saying that people are not rational or that certain arguments advancing their beliefs are not rational. They okay. are. They have some very good arguments. But their ultimate reality of their worldview is not. The ultimate reality of the worldview is bare matter. And okay. bare matter, just molecules in motions, actually be predating molecules. There's no thought that those molecules or that matter has. That makes sense. So there's no reason. It's it just right. it's random. Okay. In in contrast to a, a theistic worldview that would say it was brought into being because somebody else willed it exactly someone else who presumably is a rational being yeah they're able to do this so we we can look at the world and say okay the world either makes sense that it would be rationally created or random chance so that's that would be kind of the fundamental answer to 
the differences between the Christian perspective and the atheist perspective would be theists would look around and say, okay, there's a, there's an intentionality, a rationality behind this, maybe even a purpose, like sure. from the Christian perspective of love, but from an atheist perspective, that same thing couldn't be said. Right. Or, or think of it this way. Did rationality precede the universe existing or did it arise at some point much later when humans develop certain cognitive capabilities, and which will then also imply that rationality, reasoning, dies off when humanity or the universe dies off. See, that's a really interesting question, because the laws of physics had had to precede, right? I mean, there was something, even if the world began at the Big Bang, there, there, there was some math or something that had to exist. One would think, but... Right? But not if you're an atheist, because the only thing that, that exists is matter. And the laws that come, the laws of physics and mathematics that arise, arise accidentally, is the best term, without a reason or purpose. It didn't have to be this way. If you do the whole thing again, it's going to have different ways that the universe works, different laws of physics. So that that, that kind of gets at the the concept of transcendence, you know, the, the question, right? Do the laws of nature and physics, are they transcendent truths or are they contingent upon the relationship to matter? Yeah, I think it does. But the main thing I'm drawing us back to here is this is a fundamentally different way of looking at what reality is all about, right? Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to explore with this. And I, I think a lot of people don't think through this. They think, they can still have the same ideas of purpose, reason, rationality with a viewpoint like atheism that has trouble really explaining how those things developed other than randomly, accidentally. Gotcha. Gotcha. What about the pantheistic or polytheistic perspective? Yeah, these are probably, I'm going to spend a little less time on because polytheism is varied. Uh, let's let's talk about that one first. So it has a lot of variations because it's not as consistent and coherent of a scheme. But normally, what you would view is not a god outside the universe who created it, but rather the gods are beings within this universe who just happen to have a lot of spiritual power. For example, Zeus is the highest god in the Greek pantheon, um, and yet he was born. You know, he had a mother and father. He came into existence at a certain point in time. The universe was already here. And he is not in any sense omnipotent or omniscient. He can be deceived, and he often is. He gives in to, to lusts and mates with human women, you know, all the time. So <laughs> it, it's, it's not, I hear some people say, well, you know, if you move away from all those gods, of those are religions, and then Atheism is just subtracting one God more. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's like you, you've totally missed the picture on this. Those gods had a fundamentally different relationship to reality than the God of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So they were beings of spiritual power within the universe. That's really helpful because I've heard that same kind of thing Have you? of like, oh, we just deny, you know, Christians will just say that there's only one God. It's like saying that, you know, Apollo and, you know, Pan and, Christians will just take away all of them and just have one God. And you're saying that, no, it's a fundamental difference. Yes. God is not part of the world. He's transcendent. That's he's transcendent and creator and, and he's fundamentally dis distinct from and apart from. Yeah. So God can exist without the physical universe, but the physical universe cannot exist without him. And that wouldn't have been true in Greek thought or no. Egypt. No. Egyptian thought. Okay, cool. About pantheism. Yeah, and this one I'm going to spend less time on just because I'm not an expert and I don't want to pretend that I know more than I do. But from what I understand, the idea, again, is that there's no fundamental distinction between God and the world because fundamentally all things are one. So there is no duality. And so any distinction between God and the physical world is 
is not real. It's an illusion that our mind believes that we have to go beyond to be enlightened about. And it stresses the eminence that God is everywhere and all things. And again, it's not like God inhabits this table that's right here in front of me in the same way that a person would, you know, that sometimes we get the wrong idea, a ridiculous idea about pantheism. It's the idea that ultimately everything around us is part of one dynamic force that you can also call God, but it's not distinct from God at all. Is ultimate reality personal? No, because this God, this oneness is not someone whom you would really pray to. He's not an individual with will, personality, values, decisions. It's more almost this all-encompassing principle or idea rather than a person like you and I would have an understanding of the term. Yeah, so we, we've been talking about the four great worldviews, theism, atheism, pantheism, and polytheism, and in this episode in particular, to how they would answer or address the, the metaphysics question. So why is this important? Like, oh, I want to hear your answer, like the so what question. Well, for me, at least, this has been the most important part of forming my, my intellectual thoughts about Christianity and what it means to be a believer, as well as why I would not go down one of the other roads. But before we talk about that, can I give an illustration or two of what this might look like to help kind of clarify the relationship between God and the world in these various viewpoints? Sure. Yeah. Let me give you two. They're very similar, but there's a little bit of difference, and maybe some people can conceptualize one better than the other. So imagine I have a terrarium in my hand. Maybe it's twice the size of a shoebox or something. All right, so you've got a terrarium. Imagine this represents the physical creation that we find ourselves in. So this terrarium is the whole shebang. It's the whole universe as it is. Everything is in here. Everything from the farthest star to the smallest uh, grain of sand on the sea is part of this box, this terrarium. One way of thinking through what we've been talking about is to ask a couple questions. One, is the box open or closed? And two, is there anything or anyone outside the box? Now, those two go together. For the Christian believer or a Muslim or a Jew, you would say that both the box is open and that there is someone outside the box and that someone would be God. He can interact with what happens in the box because he brought it into existence. It being open means that it is open to what he wants to do. He is able to intervene if he chooses and influence what happens within the box, within the terrarium. The atheist answer is, no, the box is closed. It's a closed system of cause and effects, and there's nothing outside of it. By definition, they would say the universe, physical universe, is all that could ever be. There is nothing outside of it. And so because of that, what happens is that you've got a closed system of cause and effect without anything outside of that to give it purpose or reasoning or anything. It, it just is. And the only thing that could change what happens in the box are the pieces that are already set in place as they work out according to the laws of physics. How would the polytheists answer this? They would say, okay, here's the box. And the gods, such as they are, are just really powerful beings within the box. So they're in the box. They're, they're in the sky. They're on, on Mount Olympus. But they're, they're born. They come to exist at a certain time period. They live within this. Maybe it's higher than us, another step or two up above us in the box, but they're in the box. So again, there is not this idea that something outside the box could give meaning or influence of things in the box. And then pantheism, the best I would understand it, they would say that the box is the sum total of everything, but it's not just physical. It's also an idea or a spiritual dimension. So that's one way of thinking about it. And another way, another analogy or metaphor, very similar, 
is think of a room. I like this one. This is a room, what, 15 by 14 or something like that. And we've got some windows here. We've got a door. So imagine this room is the universe. And maybe there's more people in here, right? We expand this room to include a whole lot of different kinds of people and different kinds of things. But ultimately, this room is the physical universe. Question is, again, is there anything outside this room? Do the windows open? Do the doors open? Or are they simply a mistake on our part to think that they're even there? Now, if that's true, if there's nothing outside the room, then by definition, the only thing that can fit the things that happen within the room are already here. And they're going to work themselves out by certain laws, but nothing outside the room can affect what happens in the room because there is nothing outside the room, right? Yeah. But the Christians and Jews and Muslims don't believe that. We believe that this room is real, but also that it's been created and us within it created by someone outside the room. That's that transcendence you talked about. Yeah. And that God or beings, if he chooses to, can affect things within this room. And it doesn't have to be he walks in the window. I mean, we've got the window over here and we're affected by the light that is outside that the sunshine coming into this room and the heat and the and we hear some road noise outside. All those things outside this affecting us in different ways because there are things outside the room. So there could even be a whole spirit realm that we may not have much understanding of, just like if we were trapped inside this room, there are a lot of things we wouldn't know about how society exists beyond this. So there may be a whole spirit realm, yeah, but this room is not the whole thing. And then again, uh, polytheism. Okay, the room is a whole thing, but, but it's a really big room and there are going to be beings who have a lot more power than other beings. And pantheism, the room is real. There's nothing outside the room necessarily, but the room isn't just physical. It's also an idea or one spirit, a one encompassing thing. Yeah. So those are kind of at the heart of what I am trying to get at. Yeah. So the, so the, the question is, is the room all that exists? And if not, does the fact that there's something outside of the room make any difference in our lives? Exactly. And this is the fundamental question. I'm going to go back. I said that the question of the relationship between God, if there is one, and the, and the world, the universe, is the most fundamental question. Because if there's not, if you know that from the beginning, if you disallow the idea of anything outside the room, then it changes everything else you believe about what happens within the room. For example, the room's just here. It was not brought into being by someone with a purpose. That means fundamentally the universe does not have a purpose. And the things within the universe don't have a purpose either because there's no one who created it with purpose. Yeah. So we are here, but we do not have a purpose except possibly what we choose to give ourselves as a purpose. That's a very important philosophical idea or the idea that our human minds are able to understand all the things about the room and even the idea that the room is all there is. Well, if I believe as a Christian that someone outside the room created this and that person is a rational being who created this for a rational purpose, it's at least consistent with that, that human beings, if we're made in God's image, like the scriptures tell us, also have a working rationality that's in tune with how the universe actually is. But if not, then you, reasoning developed much later after the Big Bang, after the room was constructed out of pre-existing matter, and it really becomes problematic on whether we can actually have confidence in our knowledge. Because our knowledge just arose as part of this historical process within the room to help us solve life and death situations and make us more evolutionary fit, not necessarily to correspond with truth. We'll come back to that idea in weeks ahead. Yeah, that, that gets into the realm of uh, epistemology and how can we know. Right. Or let me give you one more example sure. and then I'll be quiet. Yeah, no, you're good. Uh, free will. If this 
room is the only thing that exists if only matter's here, and then that matter becomes structured in various living organisms only according to the laws of physics because they're the only game in town, it becomes really hard to know or to see how we could have free will. We would have the illusion of free will, but most thoroughgoing materialists are also determinists. That is, they believe everything is determined beforehand, that we do not have genuine free will. Because if you're consistent with that belief, you come to the idea that everything has a precedent cause or explainable on the laws of physics alone. Therefore, my next actions will also have that cause. And that gets into the realm of culpability and all, all this stuff. I mean, if sure. the decisions I make are because I'm the product of the, the laws that have been placed before me and everything that's happened up until this point and natural selection, all that stuff, am I really culpable for the, for the wrongs I do against others and that deterministic framework? So sure. we'll, definitely, we'll definitely get there and that will be really interesting. But the thing that I really uh, love and think is important is that you say that from a Christian perspective, there's a purpose that has been given to us. There's a rationality that's been given to us by a, a God who's good and who's loving. And that sounds good to me. Like, yeah. I want that. And I think that it's important if there are people who are listening that if you sense that there could be more meaning beyond just what we see, that that's important to pay attention to. Sure. And and then also for, for Christians, you may be in the boat where you identify as Christian. You say you believe in Jesus, but there's ways to live internally inconsistent with the truth that God has actually put an innate sense of purpose in you as one who is made in the image of God. And we can explore what that looks like later. That'd be more to unpack, but mm -hmm. there's ways to live consistently with that truth or inconsistently. I've heard people say that sometimes Christians can live as atheists, and that's a really interesting concept. So I think one of the things that we're hopeful for is to think about these things so that we can live in such a way that's consistent. Yeah. Yeah, Christians could live as atheists, but just as often atheists will live as Christians. Say more about that. The idea that we don't necessarily have free will, that we're not here on purpose, most people find that rather difficult or even repugnant. So they don't choose to think or live that way. And yet, if they're consistent with their belief as atheists, it's hard to avoid those things. So it's not like they have found some logical way around it. It's more they just kind of suppress the issue. And they choose to live as if right and wrong are ultimate transcendent categories, not dependent on human culture, as if humanity has a purpose and that they have a purpose and that their rationality they know is able to find truth. So they're living inconsistent with their worldview, just as many of us Christians are often living inconsistent with the idea that we are here by the will of another and accountable to him. Hmm. That's a good word. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Yeah. And we'll, pick up here next time. On the next few episodes, we'll talk about how these different viewpoints would answer the questions, not only what is real, that's what we just focused on, metaphysics, but also what is valuable, what should I do, ethics involved there, how can I know things, which is what philosophers call epistemology, what's beautiful, what's the purpose of human life, what's gone wrong with humanity. So we will explore these questions and see the answers that these worldviews will give when they are consistent. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Looking forward to it. And uh, see you all next time. All right. Thanks, dude. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you hear, click follow or subscribe depending on your platform. Check the notification bell so you're up to date with new episodes and leave us a review. Until next time.